So I consider this to be a bit of a companion piece to last week's video on a cure for wellness because after describing that movie as what if Guillermo del Toro made a gothic horror version of Shutter Island and encouraging folks to recommend obscure mainstream modern horror movies that struggled to make an impact in their time, there is actually a del Toro gothic horror that perfectly fits what I'm looking for. 2015's Crimson Peak tells the story of an early 20th century Harris called Edith Cushing, who becomes romantically involved with a baronet called Thomas Sharp, who one day marries and invites Edith to come live with him and his sister Lucille at their decaying family home in Cumberland, England. However, right from the very beginning, things are not what they seem, as Edith becomes haunted by grotesque spirits warning her of the strange and startling circumstances of Crimson Peak, suggesting her life is in danger. I'll be honest, I kept that synopsis vague because this is such a plot heavy film that I don't want to give away too many details too early in case you feel compelled to check it out for yourself, but do keep in mind that once I set the scene, everything that follows comes at your own discretion. While in general atmospheric terms, Crimson Peak certainly fits the description of a supernatural gothic horror, at the heart of it is a shockingly violent love story, shrouded in deception and misdirection, as you're never entirely sure what the Sharp siblings are up to. It isn't a spoiler to say both Thomas and Lucille are suspicious as fuck throughout the entire runtime, as the film regularly highlights to the audience that they're clearly plotting something, but what that could be is where the suspense truly lies. From everything I've heard, Crimson Peak seems to have a bit of a disappointing reputation for several reasons. For one, it's honestly pretty predictable at times, although I'll admit the eventual revelation was certainly far more simple than what I was expecting, which I'll explain later. Secondly, I'm pretty sure there were some thirsty Marvel fans flocking to see it, expecting Loki to hang Dong, which no, he doesn't, but you see a cheeky bit of bum if that will help suffice the imagination. Then of course, the film came with monstrous fan expectations as it was marketed as Del Toro's return to his stylistic magical realist roots previously seen in Pan's Labyrinth. Retrospectively, you could say it was more of a warm-up to Nightmare Alley and The Shape of Water after coming off a Hollywood blockbuster, but I'd say it's best akin to the supernatural subtlety of The Devil's Backbone mixed with shocking bursts of violence. Look, I don't like to get hyperbolic when it comes to violence in movies, because I've seen more than enough depraved world cinema that American films are child's play in comparison, but all I'm saying is, when you get sucked into the immense elegance and sophistication of its classical 50s, 60s inspirations, as well as the sensitive intimacy of its characters, the few moments of violence come out of fucking nowhere, as if it suddenly took a U-turn into weird B movie video nasty territory. Del Toro perfectly explained it himself, the violence is the film's modern twist. It is a romantic, mature, Downton Abbey style period drama where violence is so deliberately out of place in this world that it has a much more pronounced presence. I mean, the movie is about rich royal socialites and aristocrats, it's the kind of movie you would take your grandparents to see, only to find yourself apologising when in the first five minutes you're confronted with this hideous spirit abomination. So from here on out, I'm going to take a linear route to reviewing the film, but please do make sure to leave your likes and thoughts in the comments below, consider subscribing if you haven't done so already, and now let's get into the finer details of Crimson Peak. So, you can essentially break Crimson Peak into two parts, the first being set in New York where Edith and Thomas become acquainted and the ensuing conflict posed by Edith's distrusting father Carter, and the second being the events that take place at Crimson Peak, a nickname given to the Sharps Mansion Allerdale Hall due to the red clay mines buried beneath it. The first part is more or less a traditional boy meets girl setup, with some mysterious foreshadowing of what's to come, as we see Edith surrounded by men who only wish to keep her safe, as the sharp siblings enter her life like sinister gothic shadows. 
both her father Carter and her longtime friend and physician Dr. Allen, who is played exquisitely bad by Charlie Hunnam. I'm so I'm sorry, I just cannot take his upper class poshness seriously when I'm so used to his bad boy tough guy personas. Like he brings a level of camp to this film that messes with the overall macabre tone of the story. That anyway, both men basically become an unintentionally burdensome and borderline domineering presence in Edith's life as she attempts to make it as a young independent author brought down by society's conservative influence. When she meets Thomas and Lucille, they effectively act like these early 20th century rebels, seemingly inspiring Edith to break away from tradition and embrace a deviance that both siblings inherently manifest. In fact, when Edith eventually makes it to Crimson Peak, her response to the house is to fill it with love, kindness and warmth, which is met with a hilarious look of disgust from Edgelord Lucille stewing in her own perpetual nihilism. I don't mean to undermine the film's classical authenticity, it is truly sincere in what it's trying to do, but I had drank a lot of caffeine before I watched it, and so in my head, I love the idea that it was secretly a surreal alternative satire of early goth and punk subcultures perpetrating the establishment at the end of the Victorian era. I know, it's an absurd, overreaching theory, but like the favourite, it made the movie so much funnier in my head, just think of it as the classic story of a shy, timid shelter girl meeting edgy rebels, but everyone is playing dress up for a pantomime and you kinda get the idea. I defend this partially on the grounds that the first half is this Shakespearean Romeo and Juliet-esque forbidden love, as Edith's father attempts to bribe the siblings into leaving town because he doesn't trust them. There's just something so explicitly off about them, and while you agree with Carter, the utter exuberance of Tom Hiddleston's performance is practically hypnotic. He's just such a gentleman that he's so good at swaying your judgement off him. Apparently Benedict Cumberbatch was originally meant to play the role, so you can see how Del Toro deliberately went out of his way to cast the most charming, seductive Englishman he could find. It's the perfect contrast to Jessica Chastain's Lucille, who doesn't even attempt to blend in with a high society. She's like another shadow in Thomas's life, constantly domineering over him, thus giving Thomas and Edith common ground moving forward. When Carter bribes the siblings to leave America, Thomas is even cruelly tasked with breaking Edith's heart, declaring to Edith that she's naive to the true burden of the human heart, that to quote, she's searching for a kind man, a pure soul to be redeemed, a wounded bird she can nourish, yet perfection has no place in love. It's a cynical shattering of the fairy tale romance Edith desires, that her innocence is so pure that she's blinded to the pain that can accompany love. But the nuance in Hiddleston's delivery greatly implies that Thomas doesn't believe his own words, that, like Edith, he also feels emotionally oppressed, even being treated by Carter and his business associates as privileged and inferior, unable to provide the strength and stability men are conditioned to live up to. Eventually, Carter is abruptly and barbarically murdered by a not-so-subtle character, leaving Edith to inherit his riches as she marries Thomas and moves to Crimson Peak. It's worth noting at this point that Edith's experience with death has already plagued her life from early childhood, when following the death of her mother, her brooding spirit already warned Edith of something wicked to come. It's difficult not to point out how glaringly obvious everything is. There's no hiding the fact that both Thomas and Lucille are clearly manipulating Edith with a purpose, but the film's focus is not on the mystery itself. It rests entirely on that conflict behind the love story. Thomas ends up caught in the middle of a tricky situation. He genuinely loves Edith and wishes to do her no harm, yet he's also obedient and loyal to his spiteful sister, who gradually becomes jealous that Thomas has found a happiness that she herself could never obtain. Despite my issues with the obvious insidious motives of Thomas and Lucille, it's the light that Edith brings to Thomas's world that honestly inspires his heart. He lives in a world of darkness and morbidity, and truly desires to escape what is essentially his version of purgatory. 
The mansion itself is spectacularly thoughtful. We learn that it's slowly sinking into the ground due to the red clay mines beneath it, adding a symbolic nature to it as if it were devouring beauty, leaving the surrounding area a dying landscape. The film constantly emphasizes light and dark, especially between the Cushings and the Sharps, and the red clay itself literally mirrors blood running down the walls as if we're sinking into hell. It even makes the recurring spirit within the mansion even more impactful. For the record, YouTube, this is not blood, thus technically doesn't require censorship. The red clay makes the spirit look vengeful and hateful, as if it crawled out of hell to warn Edith before she suffers the same tragic fate the spirit did. The supernatural occurrences are incredibly brief, but they provide a remarkably refreshing aesthetic, amongst all the other hijinks that were inspired by the likes of the Conjuring. It's like poltergeist levels of grotesque that we rarely see these days. Hell, it reminded me of Dead Man's Float from Are You Afraid of the Dark? The spirit is somewhat uncleansed. It needs to finish its business so it can rest. So with the ghost's romantic tension and eerie surroundings established, let's talk about that big reveal. Obviously spoilers, so brace yourself. Just to give you an idea of where my head was at, I thought the reveal would be that Thomas and Lucille were ghosts, given how eerily displaced they are before we get to Crimson Peak. Despite their own aristocratic status, they are the opposite of the prestige their family supposedly represented, which Carter clearly identifies, suggesting them to be bastard children or outcasts that, at worst, aren't actually who they say they are. Them being imposters sound like a possibility due to the fact that the has not only an otherworldly feel, but it's completely dilapidated, yet in actuality, they're simply murderous con artists. So correct me if I'm wrong here, because it is explained by various different characters at different points in the film, but the story goes that Lucille and Thomas came from an abusive household, where Lucille grew increasingly resentful and psychopathic towards her mother, before eventually poisoning her. Upon being released from a psychiatric institution and inheriting her father's violence, Violence, she masterminded a plot to have Thomas marry various rich women and have them sign away their wealth before killing them in order to fund Thomas's clay mining invention. It was obvious then that Lucille murdered Edith's father because, after all, her and Thomas are the only two brooding goths in the film with shots lingering on their suspicious faces. The ghosts Edith sees are previous victims attempting to warn her, which itself is suggested to be a unique ability only Edith possesses after an earlier conversation with Dr. Allen regarding ghost photography. However, as I said, Thomas's love for Edith is truly sincere. He does want to be with her and move away from the murder and debauchery that has brought both siblings nothing but misery and despair. Lucille, on the other hand, indulges in it. She thrives on the perpetual grimness of her surroundings, even to the point of finding a disturbing lust for it when Edith discovers Lucille and Thomas Thomas engaging in incestuous sexual shenanigans, which to that I say, going back to the plot for a cure for wellness, can 20th century aristocrats please stop trying to bone their families? In fact, that just goes for anyone. Just fucking stop it. I would be lying if I said I wasn't initially just a little bit smug about my theory of the Sharps being dead, but the actual twist is legitimately clever because not only did I not see it coming, but it also frankly grinds the film in a way that's much more disturbing. It overhauled my expectations because I was anticipating a big supernatural payoff with witchcraft gates of hell levels of cinematic chaos, but the more I thought about it, the more provocative the surprising simplicity became. It enters into a sort of H.H. H. Holmes serial killer territory. We see Lucille show her unrelenting hostility in attempting to murder Edith and Dr. Allen, who arrives at Crimson Peak after investigating Carter's murder. I will admit I like that Dr. Allen doesn't save the day or act heroic in a traditional sense because I took an unfair dislike to his character and hated the idea that he would take away Edith's thunder, so it's appropriate to me that he ends up incapacitated during most of the climax. Anyway, it's at this point that we see a really gritty, painful knife fight, which sees Lucille accidentally kill Thomas by stabbing him in the cheek in a prolonged Del Toro-style processing scene, soon leading to Edith killing Lucille with a shovel loosely akin to the same method of execution used on her mother. 
It's one of those endings that left me feeling a little ugly inside with how abrupt the violence becomes, especially to Thomas, whose spirit returns for a final farewell, as both he and Lucille now haunt Crimson Peak alone, just as Lucille always wanted. I would not call it bittersweet, however, given Thomas and Lucille get their comeuppance as Edith returns home having grown from her ordeal, finally allowing her to finish her book inspired by Crimson Peak based on the feedback she received from publishers earlier in the story. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. Please leave your thoughts in the comments below, even tell me what films you would like to see me cover in the future. And until next time, stay safe, beware of Crimson Peak, and I'll see you all very soon. Bye.